At this time, we're going to do a silent key ceremony. With sadness, we remember William Fredson, whose last transmission was February 19, 2023. Uh, he was 82, age, death. The silent key is a term from telegraphy and early radio. When an operator passed away, the operator's telegraph key became silent, hence the name silent key. The ceremony is usually performed as follows. The silent key's call sign is called three times. When voice is used, the third and final call ends with Sierra Kilo. And in the case of Morse code, the pro sign for end of transmission, da 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 da, which is SK sent with no pauses between characters. So in memory of Bill, we'll observe, we will observe the silent key ceremony. I will be acting as net control. Net control calling KD6 LTB. Net control calling KD6 LTB. Net control calling Kilo Delta 6 Lima Tango Bravo. Nothing heard. Rest in peace, Bill. We'll miss you. Sierra Kilo. Okay, and we have another gentleman that passed away also. His name was Alan Dean Boyack. Uh, we just knew him basically as Alan on the net. In memory of our friend Alan Dean Boyack, we will observe the silent key ceremony. <coughs> Net control calling KF7HFI. Net control calling KF7HFI. Near control, calling Kilo Foxtrot 7, Hotel Foxtrot India. Nothing heard. Rest in peace, Alan. We'll miss you. CR Kilo. We appreciate that. You know, uh, everybody has so much to add to our club. And when we lose one, it's just, it really gets to us because it's hard to fill the hole that they leave. And you know, as we do this little ceremony, think about this. That radio signal goes out and out and out and out and out and out. For eternity, and we got to think in the terms of eternity. Anyway, thank you for your uh, reverence. Appreciate it. Now, the bombshell. <laughs> this is a bombshell, and it is something that everybody is going to be able to participate and help and use their expertise and their talents. Pat Milan of the Rocky Mountain Division of the ARRL has asked our club to sponsor the 2024 ARRL Mount, uh, Rocky Mountain Division 
Ham Fest and Convention. Yeah! to draw up to a thousand people to this event. And so we've got a year and a half to prepare for it. I know it's a ways away, but when we started figuring it, we said, oh my gosh, we got to get going on this thing. So the board has had a couple meetings together, and I would like to introduce the chair, chair, co-chairman. One is Keith Potter, and the other one's Rachel Campbell. So uh, we're still trying to figure it out as well. And when we got the news and uh, it was accepted, um, the board started to research all the uh, ins and outs of how they've done it in the past. It's a pretty daunting uh, task to take on, but it's going to be really cool. It's going to really bring a lot of uh, publicity and a lot of attention and focus to Southern Utah and to this club in particular. And we'll probably partner up a little bit and get some other clubs involved in the area. Um, but it, it's going to be something that we're going to need everybody. And so, you know, we would love, we always want to encourage everyone to get involved in the club. Um, so this is one thing we really are going to lean on everyone to help out. So it's, it's, it's going to be a convention. We're going to have different uh, committees. We have uh, you know, booths that we have to manage. Food, uh, vendors, education, food, publicity. Forums or, or panel discussions. So we're in the very infancy of putting it together. Uh, we're going to go out and figure out which venue. We're looking at a few large venues here in uh, southern uh, Utah, fairgrounds, possibly Dixie Center. We're going to figure out what's going to be the best uh, place for us to do this, both cost-wise and logistically. Um, but we are going to be reaching out over the next you know, year and a half here as we plan this out and keeping everybody updated, but also bringing a lot of you in and trying to find out who wants to head up certain departments for us. Um, what else should we say at this moment? It's, what are the dates? The dates right now, that's a good question. Yes. So we're looking for possibly two dates. Uh, we'd love to do it in October, but everything is sort of booked up in October. So it's going to be probably the last weekend in September or the first weekend in November of 2024. Um, we will probably start it most likely. We're still trying to figure it out how long, but we think we'll probably start it on a Friday, go in through Saturday, and then maybe on Sunday it's like just a breakfast before people leave town if they want it. And we'll do something that morning as well. Um, yeah, it's going to be fun. I just I don't know what else to tell you at this point. Mm -hmm. We're we're still pretty brand new at this because well not at this but in the process because it did just happen what Tuesday. Yeah. So we're still you know really getting it together um, and coming up with that plan of where we're going to go. And once we have that, we're going to really really want help. <laughs> so if you know a guy or a gal who can do something, please keep us in mind. Can we have your email addresses so we can contact you? And yes, in fact, I'll send an email out um, just through to, the club I have, yeah, through the club system. So, okay. And that's another thing too, real quick, just a side note since I mentioned email. I don't know if uh, everybody here is getting the new emails that we're doing now. So if you're not getting them, um, you might want to double check with me before you leave tonight. So I can make sure that we figure out why you're not. You might be going to your junk folder, but we're obviously uh, sensitive about too much emails coming in. We don't want people to feel like they're being spammed. So we'll be very judicious about how we send out the emails. But it's a great way for everybody to know what's going on in the club and to stay abreast of the club in general, but also this particular event, which we'll set up a side email for that, uh, people that want to get involved in it. So, okay. Yeah, but like we said, this is still in its infancy, and so we will have, um, I see you, uh, <laughs> we will have more information for you as we're going. So next month we'll have more information, and we'll just keep going from there. Yes, Adam? Do anything? Yeah. Uh, were we, we were going to also be sending out surveys, is that correct as well? Yeah. To get people's That's input, cool. is that yeah. correct? Yeah, so what we're going to probably do is in the next week, or probably an email is going to come out. We're going to, asking for your help to develop a... Um, not only a theme, but a name for what we want to call this, because if this goes successful and we don't want to shoot ourselves after we're done, then it might be something that we might do again later, and uh, it'd be kind of cool to have that same recurring theme, you know, whatever that is, the such and such ham fest, 
you know, in convention or whatever. So we're going to ask for uh, input from the club. Uh, you know, maybe have a list of names that you kind of vote on or even take suggestions and vote on those. So maybe we'll do a round of throw us your suggestions and we'll do a poll. And the email will be a great way to get that out. So again, if you're not getting those emails, check your junk box and uh, see me if you can't find it. I think there were a few emails that did bounce back, about five or six. So we obviously have some email addresses incorrect in our system. How many got the emails recently? Oh, great. Good. good. Yes, super. So if you didn't, you can also go on the website. If you just joined, you remember, we'll get your email address into the system. And if you are, if you know anybody that's not a member and they want to know what's going on, you don't have to be a member. You can go to the website, go under membership, and you can click on just to sign up for the emails. Okay. Any other questions right now? No, you're as shell shocked as we are. <laughs> <laughs> we had a three-hour meeting today, just brainstorming, <clears throat> just throwing stuff up, you know, and writing down and notepad, notepad. It's it's going to be a, it's going to be a cool event, very cool We're, event. But you know, hey, we don't care ourselves. It's going to be easy. It's going to be a challenge. Yeah, we're inviting uh, possibly the Cedar City Club and the Mesquite Club to participate too. To help with our committees and the like. I mean, we're going to have, you know, people have to help us with parking. We're going to have to have people that help us with, we, we're going to have a swap meet uh, on that Saturday morning. Um, you know, Security. we're going to have to coordinate vendors, speakers. We might bring in a couple of the YouTubers, a couple of large um, manufacturers, hopefully, if they say yes. Small manufacturers. Um, <coughs> So it's going to be a cool event for, for the whole area. Hopefully, draw people from Vegas as well as from the uh, from the division. Don't forget the QLF contest. QLF contest. Okay. Yes. We will write it down. Yeah. Do you know what that is? No, no. I don't. You <laughs> don't. QLF is a is a ham prefix stating that it sounds like you're sending with your left foot. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody built a large wooden key. That they have a contest on, and you actually send that it out. Okay. With your cool. Level. That would be cool. Yes, okay. okay. That's I great. See, that. so anybody like this? That you know, that kind of thing right there. Right those there. are the kind of things that we'd love to know about. If you do know it, mm -hmm. I don't. So, I mean, the only reason I'm jumping into this is because I have a I background you. in, you know, organizing events and large movie productions and that kind of stuff. So it sort of falls into that kind of mode of managing all these departments. Rachel obviously is into that same thing. So. We need the advice and help from anybody that has these suggestions. We're open to yes. anything. Okay? Yes. Indeed. Um, and then real quick before I sit down, April 15th, we have a booth at a um, emergency preparedness fair in the Bloomington State at the Manzanita building. That is off of the Man of War. You turn left onto Bloomington um, Circle Drive. And then it is the sixth left. And then it is on the left. We'll put a map on it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we don't need a lot of people. We are just going to man that booth and uh, kind of hawk ham radio. But we will have a radio there. So if you'll be listening between 10 and 12.30 on the 15th of April, which is a Saturday, so that you can talk back to <coughs> people, that would be super. And then the last thing I have is that if you are at Winter Field Day, I have the set up and tear down buttons, the collector's buttons, and the showing up and and just working a radio button. So. Okay. All right. Anything from Colby or? No, the same was the only thing I had to cover. So. Okay. Yeah, there'll be a lot more coming. We just yes. want to get the, the news out to you now, so you didn't hear it secondhand and got misinformation, and you'll get more information very soon. So, thank you, guys. talking. What I'm going to have is these three guys are supposed to talk, not theory, but practical, their practical experience with HF antennas. And the types of things that I'd like them to discuss are, I know Max going to talk about HOA communities and stuff, but the different types of antennas that you've had experience with, it's like if someone came to someone and said, hey, I need an HF antenna, what should I consider? That kind of information is good, I think. Um, so Mac said he had a presentation on the antennas. 
What he's going to do is talk about an antenna, one antenna, and then all three of you guys are going to comment on that kind of antenna. And then you guys can talk about other antennas, and you guys can ask questions. And that's the end of my moderation. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done, Nancy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start off um, with the off-center fed dipole. Uh, what I'm talking about are antennas that I either currently have or have used successfully. And most of these are in an HOA. So let's go to the off-center fed uh, dipole. Is that in the <laughs> Okay, so here's what the off-center fed is. It's a Palomar Engineering off-center fed 40 meter dipole. Now here's the cravat to it. Um, it's very well designed. Uh, I've worked with Hop Center or with uh, Palomar engineers for years because I used to live a few miles from them. But the problem is the antenna is rated for all bands at 30 feet in the center. And most of us can't put it at 30 feet in the center. Mine is at 18 feet and it's flat and it works extremely well. I have two of them. One runs east-west, one runs north-south. And I have an antenna switch because I don't know how long you've been on HF, but I find that if I turn between the two, the signals either improve or deteriorate. I also have a vertical on the third position of the switch because I find that the signals change and sometimes the vertical is the better. So that's the off-center fed dipole. Do you have a comment on it? No, I have no experience with off-center fed dipoles. <laughs> I've never used off-center fed dipoles in my life. To get satisfactory performance out of an off-center fed dipole, you must have the, the, the off-center, the ballon, at 30 feet, 35 feet, preferably. When you say 30, 35 feet, you're talking about X. Are you talking about the center of the antenna? The, yeah, the, the, the feed point of the feet. antenna. Oh. They can come down to 10 feet. Yeah. Okay, so it has to be 30 feet. Maybe. Yeah, you need the feed point at 30 to 35 feet. Um, they're a little bit noisy. Mine, I put an 80 meter vertical um, portion on it um, in between the feed point and the coax. I don't know that it really did much of anything. Um, my opinion, if you're going to run an off-center fed, just run a dipole. <laughs> you got to get it up anyway. So okay, the, the reason... They are multi-band. Go ahead. Dimensions-wise, Dimensions for a 40 meter, you're talking about 66 feet. Oh, there 44 on one side, 22 on the other. But you can vary that. You know, you are, I live in an HOA, and so I am stuck with what I have. So if you can do an off-center fed at an 80-20 ratio, you can do it at a one-third, two-thirds ratio. You can do it at a 95-5 ratio. You can do it at a variety of ratios. So just because you're constrained, don't give up. Because that's my message. Try different things. You know, use what you have space-wise. And uh, you can droop the edges, the ends. You can do all kinds of creative things. An off-center fed dipole, I happen to think, is pretty good. If you want to extend it, you can make that into a Carolina window by you know, adding a 15-meter vertical component to it. So it's a very versatile antenna. I wouldn't poo-poo it and say, eh. Every yeah. antenna has advantages and disadvantages, right. every right. single one. Right. I mean, somebody might say Yaggies are great. They're directional. Right. So, right. Um, Fair? Yeah. yeah um, I've heard that one issue with uh, off-center fed dipoles is Okay, let me address that. The reason I have the Palomar Engineering is if you look at this box, it has a four to one ballon. It also has an un un in it, which keeps the radiation off the coax. That's the reason I bought this antenna rather than any of the other ones, because it's well designed. And you see this wire here on it? That's number 14. HOA, it looks terrible. Mine, I took the wire and substituted number 22 motor winding wire, and you cannot see it. And I'll show you a picture of that later. That was a question. Exactly what I was going to say that you need some kind of choker. On, on, yeah, on, and that's why I bought this one. It's built in. And I, that, I ran one for years and absolutely loved it. 
Okay, and that box on mine is at 18 feet. When my tree grows a little taller, it will grow. <laughs> okay. for, the, lower band. for the guys that are new on HF, when we say choke and this type stuff, are, are we losing anybody? Don't be shy. Uh, un-un. Uh, un-un. Un-un keeps, there? believe it or not, on your coax, there's three conductor, uh, con- uh, uh, conductors. You got the center conductor, which is what you normally would consider to be positive. You got the shield, which is the other side or negative, but you also got the inside of the the shield radiates. And you want to keep the radiation off of that shield, and you use a choker, un-un. And an un-un is simply a a ballon wound to do that. Unbalanced to unbalanced. Yes, rather than unbalanced to balance, which was a ballon. So that's why it's important to choose your... um, manufacture that off-center fed wisely. That's why I did my research and I, I'm very happy with, uh, with uh, Polymar. The next antenna is one we used at field day. We used it two or three years in a row and that's the NVIS. NVIS means near vertical incident sky wave. Okay. Okay, yeah, get off of that. Give me, give me a picture. Okay. Okay. This is my backyard. It's my antenna test range. <laughs> okay. It's 80 feet between the fences. That's the golf course. Okay. They're teeing off right here. Oh, sorry. Right here, they're teeing oh. off. Okay. And they're on this golf path that's nine and a half feet below my yard. That pole is seven feet tall, and you can just barely see it, but right up there is the number 22 wire. Okay, it's a dipole. It, it runs uh, 34 feet in each direction. That's a one-to-one balance. It's level. My antenna test range consists of the um, Harbor Freight flagpole, and the Harbor Freight flagpole comes with a a, a round uh, plastic tube. That plastic tube is cemented into the ground in the center of my yard, and the flagpole sits down there. So I've got various adapters so I can put different poles in there when I want to test different antennas. Another picture, please. Okay, this is how I do my antennas. That's half-inch PVC pipe. You can see the number 22 wire. That, that's paracord into a tree. That is west. Okay, you'll notice that it hangs down. That's how I tune my antennas. I make them long, and then I shorten them up by pulling, pulling in. And if I shorten it up, I wind this wire onto the antenna wire. That shortens it. If I need to add to make it longer, then I hang this piece here on, and it's okay to hang it, it's okay for it to droop, all right? That works. What I've discovered, if I go any further out than an eighth of a wavelength from the center, I can actually start to droop the antenna, and it still works. That's from practical experience. Another question, please. Those are all the NVIS. Okay. Uh, notice the insulator uh, again is PVC. I just drill a hole through it and use it. I use that on all my antennas, and it basically, because it's gray, it disappears with the HOA. Tom? Okay, that's all of your antennas? No, um, I've got. You want to go through all of your antennas? No, you, I want you to comment on NVIS. NVIS, okay. NVIS to me is an antenna that is low enough so that it doesn't radiate out this way. The lobes are not um, um, at an angle to do DX, but it's an angle, uh, it's got a vertical lobe so that you can reach somebody, let's say 600 miles away or maybe 400 miles away. Um, So it goes directly up and down, um, basically. Um, Any antenna can be an NVS antenna in my experience, as long as you mount it fairly low. 
even a long wire antenna, um, you know, 140 feet long wire antenna that you usually want to hang up at 50 or 60 feet high. If you hang it down at uh, 10 or 20 feet, it becomes an envis antenna. Um, at lower frequencies, uh, 80 uh, and 40 meters and 160, uh, envis antennas are preferred, to me at least, because the, uh, the distance that signal goes is not very far, unless the, your conditions are really good. You can talk to Europe on 40 meters or 80 meters, but that's pretty rare. So you'll be talking to neighboring states um, in uh, the U.S. basically on those uh, NVS antennas. In this antennas, being an MCOM guy are near and dear to my heart. Um, it's meant to talk close, not to talk far. Just like they said, you can take a coat hanger, make it straight, get it 10 to 15, ideally 15 to 20 feet off the deck. And uh, the reason it's called Invis, Near Vertical Incident Skywave. So your takeoff angle, rather than being out, just like Tom was saying, almost goes directly up and bounces directly down. So that point where you are comes up and comes down, it's a lot closer than if your takeoff angle is 45 degrees or something. <clears throat> Um, so in emergency communications, we like Invis antennas because typically disasters are local. We don't want to talk to Europe. <laughs> we want to talk to the guy in the next county or the two counties over. But any antenna, Invis is a configuration, not a type of antenna. So any antenna can be put into an Invis configuration. Yes, we had a comment? No? Wave. Okay, the next antenna is the 40 meter quarter wave vertical. Yes, what? I'm just going to say, did you have an Envis antenna at one of the field days? We had it three years park? in a row. Yeah, where you put it you know, on the ground. Yes, and what, what I wanted to show you in those pictures is it really, the performance is enhanced if you use reflectors. And what I did is I went online and I bought three 100 foot Stanley. 100 foot uh, steel rulers. I put one directly underneath the antenna at 74 feet, and then three feet on either side of the antenna, I put the other two. So I had three, three under the antenna, and that greatly improved the performance. We, we scored unbelievable points with five watts in that antenna. Unbelievable. So they do work. And the advantage of the antenna, as you saw it there, is all I had to do was pick up that pole and lay it on the grass and nobody saw it there. Remember, your HOA says permanent structure, permanent antenna. If you're doing something that's up and down, it ain't permanent. Okay, let's go to the next one, which is the 40 meter vertical. So I had a cabin in Duck Creek and I wanted to go crazy. So what I did is I built a 40 meter vertical out of EMT conduit. That antenna is 34 feet long, and it's fed with a four to one balance, and the coax comes down and goes through conduit back to the ham shack. It has eight 34 foot radials on the compass points. That antenna was a killer. There's no noise in Duck Creek, killer antenna, just absolutely killer. Next slide. That shows you how the uh, when I was putting in the feed system for it, all I did was uh, throw some cement in the ground and uh, an iron pipe, and away we go. Next one. I built them out. Now these things here, I had a uh, a um, uh, golf cart that I wanted to put bigger wheels on, and I had my son make me some wheel adapters, and then I sold the golf cart. That's a wheel adapter. <laughs> And what I did is I repurposed it so that I had a plate for my grounds. Okay, that's how that works. Next slide. There's your four to one balance. I put it in a, a plastic food container to keep it dry. Next slide. That's all of them for this one. Okay, you'll notice the mount. I built that. that. That's just a piece of aluminum. I went down to a, a surplus and got a piece of aluminum. The idea is that you can have an antenna that's full size and it's a killer. I currently run at Sun River a 40 meter vertical. 
and we'll get to that. Uh, but let's talk about verticals, Tom. The only vertical I have is a repurposed eBay um, multi-band antenna, uh, vertical antenna that was sold by eBay uh, to be an antenna without radials. Uh, that was the first antenna I, I bought when I came here, uh, and uh, I was kind of weary about putting up antennas, but I kind of put it up, and I put it up on the roof, and I managed maybe one or two contacts on it. It was a terrible antenna. Uh, I decided to open that antenna up and see how it was made. And obviously it was some Chinese specialty antenna. Uh, it had a big box on the bottom. The big box, a plastic box, came apart. And inside was a pack of about 200 resistors. Oh, wow. <laughs> to balance the antenna out. Uh, the, I mean, they made the math they did was perfect. It was really good math, except the whole signal was lost in the resistors. So I, I repurposed the antenna. I extended that. That antenna was 20-something feet, 21 feet. I extended that antenna a couple more feet with an aluminum, piece of aluminum pole I got at a, uh, Ace Hardware Store, a piece of aluminum uh, um, quarter wrench uh, uh, rod. Um, I removed that whole pack in there. I put a 1 to 48, uh, 49 uh, Unun in there, not a Balun, a Unun, uh, auto transformer, 1 to 49, uh, and made it into a half wave antenna for 17 meters. Um, basically, the ground is a stake in the ground. It goes to the uh, uh, union, and the union is now contained inside that, uh, uh, that um, area where the, the uh, bulk resistor pack was in. Uh, all it is, it's a ferrite <coughs> that I wound, and uh, it, uh, it's capable of uh, uh, holding about 1,000 watts. 1500 watts. It doesn't. It doesn't smell burned. When I push <laughs> 15,000 watts into uh, 1500 watts into it. Depends on uh, who's smelling. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> yeah. It's a great test. And uh, and uh, it uh, it radiates pretty well. It has a very low angle of radiation because it is a half wave antenna, and it's straight on the ground. Right, right on the ground. It, it's not up high. It's uh, it's right on the ground, attached to a to a T post that I pounded in the ground, and I pounded a, a, a ground rod on it. So the antenna got repurposed. It works great for 70 meters, but that's it. Only 70 meters. That 40 meter vertical is now mine. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. <laughs> so anybody trying to sell you a vertical antenna that doesn't require radials, make sure they sell you the snake oil to go with it. No, I got one and it works. It, it works, but how well would it work with radials? I got it. It's not made for radials. It's not even grounded. It's a, it's a vertical, uh, off-center fed dipole is what it is. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. And it's... Uh, as a flagpole, what it's made for is a flagpole. I got busted on my HOA because I had a portable antenna out there. I said, get it out of there. I'm going to find you 250 a day. So I cut it out, put this up, and it's uh, minus 20 foot. It's a flagpole at the top, light on the top, and it works great. I got Japan the other morning. What's your manufacturer? Because I'm interested in flagpole antennas from the same Now, the manufacturer is terrible customer service. Okay. But the antenna works. You get it, you, buy, you just buy a flagpole antenna from them. You go to Palomar to get your unit, and you buy uh, your uh, uh, your um, light on the top from somebody else. But it's a uh, gray line performance, and oh, yeah. the customer service is absolutely atrocious. But the radio does work. I mean, the antenna works great. It's not as good as my Tenadyne T11 at home on 65 foot tower, but I can't have that down here. So any antenna you get is a compromise. Yeah. I'm just grateful to be able to get out and talk to somebody. And I do a lot of uh, parts on the air. I'd be quite successful with it. The advantage to vertical antennas is they have a small footprint. They don't take up 60 feet or whatever. The disadvantage is they tend to be expensive. Yeah. And they're great for talking to people far away. 
They suck for talking to people close. Because okay? they do have a low angle of radiation. Go ahead. I'm Alan at 1 and when I was looking for a house a couple of years ago, my primary criteria was no HOA. <laughs> so I was at an older home up in Washington. And when I put up, um, you know, verticals have a reputation as being an antenna that radiates equally poorly in all directions. And the reason is, so often people don't have a decent radio system. I've got a 60 BTV, which is a 24 foot, 6 band track vertical. But I've got 40 radios on it. And it gets out really well. On a field day, for example, last year, I made 650 contacts. I had no trouble holding the frequency when I'm running stations. So I, I know I was getting out quite well. But it's got 40, 40 radios. And, yep. that's the kind. and so radials are better on verticals. Oh, yeah. The other disadvantage to verticals is they're noisier than your horizontal antennas. We had a hand up over here. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit how you decide what baleon to use? You said a four to one. One, oh, one to 49. Now, normally on a dipole, you use a one to one. If you're gonna feed the dipole with ladder line, you would use a four to one. And uh, then in addition to that, you can use an un, -un. And uh, the best place to put that is up at the top I have one that's down at the bottom. It kind of sort of worked, but not real well. So the, the reason you would use a one to one, the radio is looking for what? How many ohms is the radio looking for? 50. A perfectly tuned dipole gives us how many? 75. 75? So a one to one is all you need. What does ladder line give us? More 50. About 200? What's 200 divided by four? 50. Now do you see where the four to one comes into play? Okay. There's also current balance and voltage balance. You gotta differentiate between those. You wanna use a current balance to get rid of TVI and all that other stuff, okay? Let me address two things. Uh, the flagpole. Um, I happen to know quite a bit about HOAs because, uh, and CCNRs because I've been the president of a couple of those things. And there's an outfit in Georgia that writes them. And contractors are lazy, so they go to Georgia and get the latest and greatest. And that company keeps getting updates. The latest thing that we try to sneak around, they f you find it in the latest update. And so my HOA in Sun River said no flagpole. So to allow you to have the opportunity to display the flag, they put a 45 degree pipe in your front of your garage, oh, no. and that's where you put your flag. No flagpoles, period. Oh, no. Okay, so that's the other thing you have to worry about. Uh, the problem with the flagpole that we found uh, with friends of mine that have had them is you've got to have ground. So this one here, I don't know anything about. It, it works without a ground. But the, uh, the normal flagpole is basically a vertical. Right. And so you gotta have the other half of the signals gotta be in the ground. Um, what was that, you are talking about flagpoles, you were talking about? Yeah, I have a 6 TV, which is a six band trap. He's got 40. Oh, radios. four radios, number of radios. Okay, when I lived on my farm in Michigan, I'm also an electrician. Uh, in those days, they threw away the end of the reel of the wire you know, they'd run, a, they'd run around a wire and they'd be 40, 60, 80 feet on the reel and they'd throw them. And I collected all that. I got a high tower. Do you know what a high tower is? It's basically a roan tower with a pipe on it. Ends up being 60 feet. I mounted the high tower and I started out with four radials and I started contacting on 160 the same people day after day after day with signal reports. And I doubled it to eight then I went to 16, then I went to 32, and I went to 64 radials. I had a farm. And I would take the wire out and put a nail in the ground to hold it straight. What I discovered was there was very little improvement after eight radials. That's why the vertical I put up at Duck Creek had eight radials. It's not worth the work, okay? So the vertical at field day had eight radials. <laughs> Yes. Uh, how did you experiment at all with lengths of the radials? Yes, the radials were all the same length, 120 feet. I was on 160 meters. Okay. 
Can you wrap them back if you don't have No, feet? Um, you, you, you can, you bend, can them. bend them a little bit, but radios need to be out and look like like that. Okay. So if that, you don't have 120 feet, well, that's much you can do. You're, you need to operate on upper bands. Okay. Okay, um, okay yes? Yeah, I've got a Pushcraft AP Alpha Papa 8 that's an old uh, multi-band <coughs> vertical that covers all of the HF bands from 80 through 10, including the three work bands. They used to make that. It was reasonably priced back in the day when I bought it. Mm -hmm. But I have, like you said, eight radials, but the kit they made that went with it had, it was like ribbon cable, yeah. that each one was a different length. And right. So you had one for 80, you had one for and so that's under our synthetic grass in the backyard. Works great. Uh, there's yeah. times when I can hear things, especially the distant stations, the people with the horizontal antennas can't hear the complaining that the band's not open, but I'm listening to people up in Washington State and California that they're not hearing because their angle of radiation is different on there. So, Okay, uh, Gary. I, I was going to mention one other thing, too, is uh, GAP makes an antenna called the Eagle DX, which is 40 through 10. Yep. I got that for a uh, silent key uh, before, you know, several years before I passed away for Bob Palumbo. Uh, when we took his tower down, I got that antenna for him and mounted it on a pole in his backyard. So it was only like the pole was 10 feet tall and then this antenna went above it. It did not require radials. It had a matching, uh, they were kind of like radials on it. To, and you put a, a, a coil on there to uh, separate the mm. uh, signal from the outer side, side of the coax, that thing worked wonderful. It was flat across all bands, and so it is pricey. It was like $499, but he sold his tower, so he had the money to do it, but very good antenna. Uh, you could only see the, from the backyard of his house, you could only see like eight feet. It was just a single pole sticking up there, just about inch, not even an inch wide across. It was maybe three quarters of an inch. It looked like a piece of electrical conduit sticking up there. That's all you can see from the front yard. And uh, so you can hide things in the backyards that way, so. Okay, Gary made a very important point. Uh, what I've discovered with my test is that you need uh, at least one radial per band of operation on the vertical. And it's better with two, but better with four. And uh, Jay has a, a 4BT in his backyard in Sun River, and we put those radios under the rocks, and, and they really work. But we managed to, they got one 34-footer for 40 and another properly one for 20 and stuff, and that's what makes his uh, 4BT sing. The other thing I wanted to mention is HOA. People hate shiny and white. So don't put up a white vertical. That's why all my verticals are painted. Um, that's why I recommend the 1480B, the tram eye antenna for two meters and 440. It's black. Black seems to disappear. I'm married to a lady who tolerates my antennas, and I had black antennas on the car, and she couldn't find it in the parking lot. So that's a testimony. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got time for one more antenna, man. Okay, I want to show them the perfect antenna. Oh gosh, the perfect oh. antenna. I didn't, I didn't know it existed. Uh, when I became a ham in 1958, I bought a Gotham V80 vertical. Spent all my paperboy money on it. And what did I get? I got some aluminum. <laughs> and, and it was 21 feet tall, and it didn't work very well. So I spent the next probably 30 years trying to develop the perfect vertical. This is a kit that I got from uh, DX Engineering, and it was supposed to work on 40 meters with that coil. I kept playing with it, and I discovered that I didn't need the coil. I made that antenna exactly 21 feet, 9 and a half inches. And I put radials under it. And I have an antenna tuner, and I worked 40 up. Okay, that antenna has since been expanded because it's the Comtech 30. It's a 30 and 40 meter vertical. It's 29 and a half feet. My tree is 28 and a half feet, so only a little bit of it sticks above the tree. It's right on the road. Okay, and, <laughs> and it's painted gray. 
don't paint it blue. Okay? It's painted gray. So either gray or black works. But you don't want shiny and you don't want white. Jay? One of the other things that I... I live in Sun River with uh, Mac also. I've got the four bedroom in the backyard and uh, Walmart sells uh, camouflage paint <laughs> which uh, in two different colors or three colors. Anyway, I got it standing near a tree and it's the same color as a tree. And the closest house behind me is about 75 feet above. And it just looks like part of the tree. And uh, <clears> that <throat> <had> antenna, <clears throat> 10 through 40, with about 12 radials, because that's all the wire I had. Uh, I've got 90 countries and worked all states. And it's ground mounted. So, yep. one more antenna that Mac won't <clears throat> tell you about, because they're kind of the bow fang of HF antennas. <laughs> <laughs> but don't discount them. If used properly, they're very good antennas. That's the NFED half wave. It's basically half an antenna. A lot of guys call it. Why would you use half an antenna? I've talked to South Africa on an NFED half wave. I've talked to Australia. I've talked to Slovakia. Um, you have to be careful of common mode current um, on your coax with NFED half waves, so pay attention. Here's the advantage of NFED half waves. Um, they're half as long as a dipole, <laughs> so they're more compact. Um, you can run them in several different configurations, and they're cheap, because you're only using half the antenna. You're basically either using a counterpoise or your <coughs> coax for the other half of the antenna. And what's counterpoise? Counterpoise is simply a piece of wire, so if you're running a 60 foot in fed half wave you need about 53 foot of counterpoise that makes you a 40 meter that dipole. makes it a dipole <laughs> there's the beauty though that 53 foot counterpoise can be hucked on the ground um, parks on the air i run an in fed half wave portable i get the uh, feed point up at about 23 25 feet I can talk to anybody in the United States. I can talk DX on that. Um, they're very portable. They're easy to deploy in a portable situation. Um, and if you're space restricted and you can't do a vertical, an infed half wave might be the answer. But you got to be careful about the, the common mode current. I, I have an NFED half wave that is uh, one of my most, most successful antennas, but it's not a half wave really because it's only a half wave at 160 meters. <laughs> and all the other f frequencies um, higher than uh, 160 um, are basically controlled by a tuner. I only use manual tuners. I don't use automatic tuners because manual tuners I can tune things up to uh, 1 to 50, you know, with an automatic tuner, mm, uh, you get to 1 to 10 and the, the automatic tuner starts complaining. The trick on my half, half wave and fed antenna is twofold. One thing, it, it doesn't go straight from one end to the other, but it goes straight for a while and then it, it angles mm -hmm. at 90 degrees just because of the location that I had. I had a point where I could come come off at 80 feet one way and then another 80 feet the other way. Also, the antenna uh, is fed through again a 1 to 49 union. The 1 to 49 union transforms my 50 ohms at the radio to the 2,500 to 5,000 ohms that the antenna usually has. Uh, I have several uh, wires going from the ground of the union, uh, which you could call counterpoise. One of them goes to the ground, in the ground, to several ground rods, and other wires go are different lengths, so they resonate at different frequencies. Uh, I played with them so that pretty much everything tunes up quite right, uh, quite fast on the uh, manual tuner, and there's no sparks flying. Uh, I, I imagine the voltage at the end of the antenna is pretty high, 
but it's terminated on uh, with the paracord, and the paracord hasn't melted, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, another antenna that I really like is called a Cobra antenna. It's, a, it's a, not a, a, um, a um, uh, it's called a doublet antenna uh, because it is not tuned for any particular frequency. I have the Cobra Senior uh, antenna, which is a purchased antenna. Uh, it is 140 feet long, but the wire goes to the end, comes back, and goes back again. So it's really three times 140 feet long. It tunes down to 160 meters, no problem. And it goes up to 10 meters. If you want to, it goes up to 6 meters. All with a tuner. Great antenna. Um, you know, I've made hundreds of countries contacts. I'm, I'm up in the 200s with the country. So uh, it's, it's, it's a really good antenna for that. It is a long distance antenna. And I have it at about 45 feet high. Uh, then I have a, another antenna, which is a, a um, kind of a G5, uh, G5R, uh, what is it called? It's called G5RV. A G5RV, but it's not. It's a, it's a modification uh, Z uh, S6 something, uh, and it's a bot antenna. And that one, all my other antennas are flat. That one, I have it in a, in a V. So I've reduced the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, 75 ohm to 50 ohms by going uh, in a V uh, configuration. Uh, works really well on 40 meters. It almost doesn't need tuning at all on 40 meters. I run three tuners. I run a, a Palomar tuner an old MN2000 uh, um, um, Drake tuner and a Z tune, an ancient tuner, uh, it's a huge box which will tune anything. It will tune a, a coat hanger, it will tune anything. Launcher. Yeah, launcher. All of them are in series and I can bypass them with switches and I can choose which one I want. And I pretty much have one on each antenna or each antenna group. So for me to jump, jump frequencies during a contest or anything like that, it's really fast. I just flip a switch and I jump antennas. Uh, I also have a smaller um, um, antenna also. The, all my antennas, except for the long wire, are fed with 450 ohm ladder line. And they're fed with 1 to 4 balon. I also have 1 to 9 balon. Uh, at the bottom, and I can switch between 1 to 4 and 1 to 9. And sometimes the 1 to 9 seems to work better, and sometimes the 1 to 4 seems to work better, it's just on a switch. So I just try it like you have a switch for different antenna direction, I use that. Um, my receive antenna only receives a loop antenna. Uh, it's a, and it works really well from, oh, let's say, 60 meters. 60 up to, uh, to 10 meters, really well. Uh, and it's very low noise and I can rotate it. Uh, it's fairly low on the ground. I have uh, one more antenna that is fed by an AH4 ICOM tuner. Very short and fed wire uh, um, that attaches maybe 80 feet attached to this AH4. <coughs> And it's spectacular on 60 meters. Uh, I, it's obviously an endless antenna. I get into Salt Lake City uh, with full 5, 9, plus 10 signal with just 100 watt allotted to me on 60 meters. Um, I've always built antennas. I like long wires antenna in California, where I'm originally from, on 40 acres of land with big redwoods. My antenna were up at 120 feet. I can't afford that anymore, but they were, they were great. They worked in a, a fantastic. Of course, I had beams too. Uh, I had multiband beams on big rotators, uh, but I've always favored the, the wire antennas. They're easy to put up and uh, they work real well.
I'll put in a plug for the American Radio with Relay League, ARRL. They've got an end fed halfway then. So you showed it up on a previous slide here a couple slides ago. I think it was like two slides back on there. Uh, they have the kit for $79.95. has everything you need to build that. That, this one? that one right there, yeah. yeah. That's actually where I pulled it from, from the AR yeah. <laughs> website. Yeah, it's $79.95, and you can order it. They have them in stock, and it comes with the, the box, the connectors, everything you need, but a soldering iron and solder. Everything is included. That's what you're seeing up there is the computer <coughs> kit, right? And the halfway for $79.95, you can't go wrong. Yeah. You will need a tuner for an end fed. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. Yep. Even for a doublet, you need a tuner. For not, no tuned right. antenna, you need a tuner. Oh, yeah, we'll get it. Yeah, Tom, can I mention something? One of the neat things about Tom's setup, um, most of us have a desk and we have radios and stuff like that. Uh, and then if you need to get something, you have to pull the desk out. Tom has a, a walkway behind his radio so he can change coaxes and all kinds of things. Like that. Wow. <laughs> so, Brett? Yes. I'm going to throw out there as well. Uh, one thing to consider when you're buying something, if, like Mac mentioned, you're doing an HOA and you're doing a portable antenna, maybe you want to get into parks on the air, that's what I find fun, is you need to be able to be self-sufficient. Okay. Um, a lot of the people we see on the Facebook group uh, for parks on the air is kind of ridiculous, but man, I just got chewed out by one of the rangers because I had my antenna in the tree, and that's where they went wrong, was they had the antenna in a tree, okay? Brett, with his POTA stuff, since he lives in southern Utah, he doesn't get a tree, because we don't have those, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you guys know those electrical um, fence posts they use for hot wires for the cows? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just take one of those, stab it into the ground, that's where the end of my end fed goes, and then my, I've got military tent poles where the feed point goes. So, so it works beautifully. Take that into consideration. You're gonna get kicked out if you're doing something they don't like. So if you give them nothing to not like, then you're set. Our setup with our antenna, is our portable vertical, we're not touching anything that's gonna get hurt. We put up a camp chair and a tripod, that's it, okay? Another thing, the ARRL, they have a phone number that you can call whether or not you're a member, which you should be, if you have any question radio related, they'll answer it. They'll, they are literally dedicated to answering questions. If you've got a question and you can't figure it out, rather than shocking yourself or getting somebody hurt or ruining an antenna or blowing a radio, give them a call. 1-888-277-5269. Take a picture of that. It will be very helpful. There's also a lot of folks in the club that would love to help you. Can I add one thing? By all means. There is a device called a, a mini VNA or micro VNA or nano, nano, nano VNA. Nano VNA. Yeah. Uh, they are as cheap as 50 or 60 bucks. I bought long. mine for less than 50. It's the most useful device you can have uh, to tune an antenna or, or look at an antenna. Basically, it's a vector network analyzer, which used to be this big and- They used to cost, cost thousands, uh, thousands of dollars. Of dollars yeah. This thing's smaller than your cell phone and can be used as a rudimentary tone generator. <laughs> it's excellent for uh, doing SWR checks and or checking your vector on the antenna. Uh, and tuning your antenna to it. Um, you, they say you have to calibrate it all the time. Yeah, you have to calibrate. If you want to be real precise, you yeah. need to calibrate it. It's not a big deal. It comes with all the little calibration um, you know, pieces to it, but uh, uh, it, it works great. It, I use it all the time on my antennas. I use it after storms. I go back and look at my antennas after a big storm has come around to find out if anything has changed. <laughs> uh, if I may, I brought some pictures of how to hang a, 
an antenna in a tree and how it works. So if you could uh, do that, uh, mounting a wire in the tree. Uh, all of my antennas float. What I do is I double do it so that the antenna floats and the antenna is actually connected to the insulator. That wire or that rope goes through that and it hangs on a weight. And depending on my 1200 foot um, a loop, I had three pounds of, or um, uh, 14 pounds of sand in a, in a big uh, PVC pipe to counter it. And the reason I do this you can see this, it, because it floats, the trees move and things move, and that doesn't break the wire. Remember, I'm using 22 wire, <laughs> number 22 wire. So that's how I use simple things like, uh, like PVC. That's a standard electrical uh, 90, and uh, it works really well. So I wanted you to see that, that that's a way to mount things and uh, let it flow. Okay. Questions? <coughs> Brian brought some Rice Krispie treats. Thanks for our tour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.